This video is brought to you by Squarespace. When it comes to websites, online stores, etc., there's no place to build a beautiful online presence like Squarespace. I would say, uh, E.T. is pretty sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing these ranked videos for a few years, and I'd be lying if I said the orders of these lists didn't change from time to time, but I feel like this one more than any of my other ranks has the best chance of changing, because I feel pretty confident in saying every Paul Thomas Anderson film demands a rewatch and a rethinking. Yes, every single one. I've used this to describe films in the past, but he's a filmmaker where you don't realize the film's full effect until the next day or the next week, sometimes even the next year. Yes, we can sit here and pick apart his many directorial trademarks, one of which apparently is just naming characters with the same name as their actors, but I truly think what stands him apart from most if not all filmmakers is his attention to longevity and connecting with an audience after watching a movie rather than during. And that said, his work is very personal, and leaves so much up to the audience's interpretation as far as what they choose to connect with. And that's my way of reminding everyone, like I do with every ranked video, that this is my PTA list. And if it's different than yours, maybe that's not a bad thing, maybe it just proves how good he is at connecting to such a wide fanbase in a lot of different ways. A fanbase I would consider myself a part of, because all of these films are pretty great and made ranking them very difficult, but I'm also gonna admit that his fanbase worships him at such an obnoxious level that all I ask is that you loosen up and go into this video with an open mind. All that said, let's get into it. I'm just kidding, could you imagine though? I don't think a lot of people would disagree with this one, to be honest. Hard Eight is his first feature, and it's also, without a doubt, his weakest. If it wasn't PTA, I don't think a damn soul would care about this movie. The courier font, the hooker, the motels, the gambling, the you think you're a tough guy line? Give me a break. Maybe it's because I've seen a PTA fanboy make a reinterpretation of this exact story in every film class I've ever been in, but this really does close to nothing for me. The only thing that really keeps it afloat is how silly John C. Riley is as portraying, uh, John. But he also shows just how irritating his scripts would be if they weren't treated with the care he would put into them later on. Inherent Vice is the PTA movie that PTA fans love to hate, and in my eyes, I really don't think it's that bad. In fact, you know what? I think it's pretty great. I mean, sure, it's second to last on this list, but that doesn't mean I think it's a bad movie. This is without a doubt PTA at his loosest and highest, but for as loose as it may seem, the film still acts under such a specific set of rules that keep it on track, which is a really impressive and admirable thing to watch unfold. I also think this is one of PTA's funniest movies. Doc is such a goofy-ass character, and Joaquin Phoenix could not have been more perfectly casted. It's very hazy watching this film, and there's lots to admire about that, but I can't really go a whole lot further about what else I connect with here. I get it, I think the haziness with the lack of connection our character feels to the world around him is saying, uh, something, but to me, at least compared to the rest of the things he's made, it, I just didn't connect with it as much as I typically like to, but that isn't to say I didn't have a good time watching it. Incredibly, and I mean incredibly bold of me to even include this after such a fresh viewing. Because it's been a few weeks since I first saw it, and I can already feel its rich atmosphere soaking itself in my brain and growing. Licorice Pizza has an incredibly colorful and warm look to it, one that I would have sat in for hours if they let me. And it's so easy to get lost in the fun, dreamy vibe it all has that you almost forget how little story there is. But that's not a bad thing, in my opinion. You know, Licorice Pizza is such a weird movie, because there is something to connect with as far as how it depicts adolescence and quote-unquote floating in time, not knowing where to go but running at the speed of light towards that nothingness. There's also a lot in here that I didn't really get, like a blatantly racist bit towards Asian people. I truly cannot wrap my head around why that was in the movie. I wouldn't say they don't acknowledge the age gap between the main characters, that relationship definitely makes sense, which is why it never pulled me out, but it's not a relationship I ever felt invested in aside from the knees touching beneath the table, that was intimate, but other than that I really didn't feel the romance here compared to how visceral the romantic tension feels in his other movies, but I still think there's so much to love about Licorice Pizza. The humor, the young adrenaline, the clever, even if not so subtle, take on how men succeed in society, the whole Bradley Cooper thing, oh my god. It's a clever, loose, and old-school kind of movie for what PTA is making nowadays, but it's definitely one that left me wanting a little bit more. Magnolia is PTA's 1999 three-hour psychological epic about a bunch of people who do a bunch of different things but all end up under the same story. Despite clocking in at just over three hours long, this movie flies by and comes with one of my favorite endings in a movie ever, making everything click together in a wonderfully absurd way. Now despite coming out after Boogie Nights, which we'll be getting into, Magnolia feels, in the context of his career, like the first time PTA came out and said, this is who I am, 
this is what I can do. It feels like a giant plate full of everything PTA is good at, writing really unique characters, building a strange atmosphere, balancing a bunch of people together, depicting the valley. It feels like what you'd expect him to make at the end of his career, yet this was his third film out the gate. And while it's definitely a great movie that feels like it was made by someone who was at least 60 years old, it definitely feels like someone trying to juggle as many things as possible. Which isn't to say it doesn't succeed in doing so, but you can feel the amount of stress and the string being pulled and almost breaking the entire movie. I wouldn't say this is a movie that gives you the time and patience to really connect with any character or narrative, rather it's trying to juggle everything as much as possible so that its larger universal argument can land on its feet. I mean, this is going to be a ridiculous analogy, but it's like when you want to take a screenshot of a bunch of things, like zoom out of all the films you've ever watched on Letterboxd or something, and you stretch it out and zoom out the page and manage to capture it all, but the longer you zoom out, the less you're able to see the details, sometimes even the titles of these movies. It's a cool thing to look at in front of you, but for a movie that is trying to make an argument for how beautiful and horrible it is to be a human, I really wish I knew more about the humans in the movie. But really, it has some of his best scenes, I mean, the whole Tom Cruise character is phenomenal, and again, the ending. Y you gotta be kidding me. You know, there was a time where Boogie Nights stood above the rest of the films on this list and where I considered it to be one of PTA's masterpieces, which, don't get me wrong, it definitely is, but I think compared to what else we have in store on this list, this simply feels like not only a PTA gateway, but a PTA that isn't full PTA. He wears his influences pretty strongly on his sleeve in this one, it may as well be a Scorsese film, but that's not to say it isn't a really amazing movie with, once again, a mood that you could live in for hours. This has some of my favorite PTA characters, Dirk Diggle played by Mark Wahlberg is one of the greatest of all time, William H. Macy as Little Bill, Julianne Moore as Amber, obviously Philip Seymour Hoffman as Scotty. He builds out such a fun yet tragic world in this film, and it's no wonder he kind of skyrocketed to the top after he made this. And it's so good. I mean, that first opening shot is one of my favorites ever. I honestly just wish he made this nowadays. I think we'd have a much better, much more nuanced and razor sharp edge to this story than the one we got in the 90s, because he's only gotten better since Boogie Nights, which is really the only reason it isn't higher on the list. The Master is one of those where perhaps the next time I rewatch it, it ends up on the top of this list. I think it's the kind of film that holds that kind of power with just how fragile and specific it gets. This is without a doubt PTA's most psychological to me. The first time I watched it, I felt extremely dizzy and on edge just off the intimate lighting and tense performances delivered by Hoffman and Phoenix. It's one of those where you walk out of it and you're like, I didn't get it, but I felt it, you know? On a technical level, this may be one of PTA's all-time greats. The cinematography, sound design, and score really pull you in. There's not a single shot that isn't paid full attention to. I think the shot of Joaquin Phoenix leaning over the ocean is one of the greatest of all time. As I've kind of alluded to, this admittedly was not a film I fully grasped the first time I saw it, nor can I say I fully grasp it at the time of writing this, which is the only reason it isn't higher than the next three films, but I still really, really love it. I think it's one that will only get better the more I revisit it, despite being his most intense film to get through. Yeah, maybe I spoke too soon. There are three films that make me feel like I'm stepping into a war zone every time I bring them up, and they're Goodfellas, The Last Jedi, and There Will Be Blood. Some context. A few years ago, I did that 100 movies in one summer video, and if I remember correctly, this didn't fully click with me when I watched it then, and it ended up pretty low on the list compared to everything else I saw, which, considering some people treat this movie with the same level of worship as Citizen Kane and The Godfather, made a lot of people think I hated this movie, which has never been the case. I always thought this was one of the best movies I had ever seen. It is hard to deny that this is a movie made by a master of his craft, and that everyone involved in the movie was on that same level. But I think at the time, compared to a lot of the other things I was watching and connecting to, this was just not the kind of story or character or message that had any lasting impact on me. And that's actually the reason why, in retrospect, speaking in 2021, I consider this to be a top three PTA. No, I don't care about the character. I think he's incredibly one-noted. I think his greed can feel shallow at times. I think Daniel Day-Lewis delivers a really amazing performance, but it feels like, okay, we get it. But for the film to lure you into his drive, his greed, his necessity for power, and this tunnel vision, but also see where that comes from, makes for a movie thicker and darker than the actual oil. This is a brutal, brutal film that really plants itself in your brain and does not leave, um, ever. I do think this is perhaps, objectively speaking, his best movie. He has never and probably will never be as controlled with his filmmaking as he was here. The stars might not align again like they did here. It's perfection, no doubt. But 
I think the only thing that holds this back from being the best for me in a completely selfish way is that it's missing a humanistic element that I would connect to. I do think Daniel Plainview is very human-like. Hell, the whole movie is essentially just a character portrait, but in all its perfections, it's lacking some real thing that I cannot describe in words that these others have. This is probably giving off the same energy as me making King of Comedy one of my favorite Scorsese films, but I can't help what I love, and I love this movie. Punch Drunk Love is famously, on the surface, one of his simplest films, but to me, a simple PTA is a good PTA. He does so much with so little, and I think that showcases his ability as a filmmaker way better than something like Magnolia does. Seriously, it's a man that wears basically one suit the entire movie, stays in one office, acts the same way most of the movie, yet there's such an exciting, high-tension energy happening from beginning to end. A love story that actually gets at what love can do to a person, told in a really hilarious and unique way. This movie feels like it exists on another planet. I think what didn't work for me in Licorice Pizza is that the love didn't feel urgent in that movie, it was only their number one priority in spurts, but for the most part they were two people searching for fulfillment in any way they could. And Punch Drunk Love is about a person who needs love. I mean, the main song is He Needs Me. Like, he spells it out for you. And I think looking at the film through that central argument really drives home why everything in the film feels so loud, so annoying, and so disruptive to Barry. It's probably the most absurd approach to a romance possible, and I love it. Whatever that real thing is that I was searching for in There Will Be Blood, Phantom Thread definitely has it. Watching Phantom Thread for the first time has to be one of my favorite movie watching experiences of all time. I remember being completely engrossed in everything in front of me, from the cinematography and score, the attention to textures and just how delicately intricate the film was presented, to the patient and controlled descent into, honestly, chaos. Yes, this is a very chaotic, unhinged, sexy, hilarious, and real movie. I'm obsessed with it. It's so real, everything about it. If you haven't noticed by now, I like PTA best when he's being vulnerable, but not whiny, which is usually just his love stories. Punch Drunk Love is such a beautiful movie about a person who only gets stronger with love in his life. Phantom Thread is the opposite, but is if anything a much more visceral and realistic look at the powers of love. From the ways in which it can infect its way into his work life, to its literally physical repercussions, to an outsider it may look absurd, and it is absurd, but it's so real and it's so hot. This movie is on fire. I mean, Daniel Day-Lewis and Vicky Creeps have some of the best chemistry ever put to film, both romantic and comedic. Johnny Greenwood's score, The House of Woodcock, one of the most beautiful compositions ever written for film. The cinematography done by PTA himself is hilariously enough some of his best. It's one of those movies that has truly never left my mind since the first time I saw it. I can't believe the Blu-ray has been like $3 on Amazon for years and I still haven't copped it. I just love it. Not only does it have everything I love about PTA in one film, but as cheesy as this sounds, it also totally reshaped how I looked at romance. And hey, that's my PTA rank. Let me know what yours is. Dump that shit in the comments. I don't know. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm right. Go crazy down there. And that's gonna do. Thanks so much for watching. Go watch a PTA movie and form your own opinion. And before you head out, I want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, lads, if there was ever a time to progress that brand of yours, it's now. Whether that be through an online store, a blog, a portfolio, Squarespace is the best place to go to make that happen. They have a wide array of award-winning designer templates that'll make that site look fantastic and match your style. Plus, they have 24-hour customer service to walk you through any issues you happen to run into. The best part about it all is that if you go to squarespace.com slash Karsten, you can get 10% off of your first purchase. As I've said, uh, there's really no better place to progress your brand than Squarespace. They've been an absolute joy to work with this year, and I cannot recommend them enough. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Thank you guys for watching this video, and you know what? See you all in the next one.